Welcome back, fantasy fiction fanatics. It's great to see you again. I hope you're doing well today and that your week was really good. Sorry that I missed the episode upload on Sunday. Um, again, with my work schedule at this uh, new job that I've moved to, it's the hours are everywhere. Every single week, my hours are different. Uh, sometimes I work in the morning, sometimes I work in the evening, sometimes I work in the middle of the day. So it's kind of crazy and hard to, for me to get uh, set scheduling time and stuff like that. So I'm working hard and I'm still trying to make the scheduling work and I'm going to upload as often as I can until I can get it back into that rhythm of the two episodes a week. So please be patient with me and um, I hope that it's not too much of an inconvenience for you. And I'm going to try my best to get us going again. I'm so sorry. But uh, let's go ahead and check where we're at in this book here. We've got, looks like over halfway maybe maybe two-thirds maybe eh, or definitely more than halfway I'm just not so sure if we're totally two-thirds but somewhere around there we're we're getting pretty good through this book gotten a good section done I hope that you're enjoying it first of all that's the most important part is that you're enjoying it and uh, yeah I really hope that we, uh, our discussions are also enjoyable for you to come back and watch every week and see what we talk about. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we are reading, cha uh, we did read chapters 16 through 20 for this episode. And so I'm going to go ahead and just do a really quick recap of that section um, of the book. We've got at the very beginning of chapter 16, we have where Gold Moon ends up being able to save Riverwind after he was burned alive by the dragon. We, um, they learn that they have to get the discs of Mishakal and everything from her vision or encounter with the goddess of Mishakal. Then they go under the city because they find out that the discs are going to be in the dragon's lair, which is under the city. So they go under the city where they uh, run into the gully dwarves that live down there and Raslin bespells them so that way they will help them out and uh, along with that the main person or the main dwarf that helps them is Bupu and Bupu go ahead, uh, decides to take them to the high bulb because he's the one that would know where the dragon's lair is which is what they're searching for and then we see them meet with the high bulb, get the map to the dragon and come up with the plan to not have to fight the dragon, but obviously since the high bulb um, betrayed them or sold them out to the dragon in order for them to having to kill them, kill the dragon. And so we just go uh, stop where they are underneath the dragon's lair, just about going in and it seems that the dragon is aware of their presence. So not too much in the way of events through these chapters, but it is important chapters as they're going ahead and searching for the, uh, the dragon's lair and trying to get these discs. So the first thing I'd like to discuss today is the gully dwarves, because they are a large chunk of this section. They are, I believe, let's double check, I think it's three or four of the chapters involve the gully dwarves. Let's see. Yep, chapter 17. So there's four chapters, which is the most, uh, only only one that we didn't, uh, that we read didn't have the gully dwarves in them. So um, they're a big important part of this section that we've read. And we haven't really talked too much yet about the specific races and beings that belong to this world of Kryn. And that's kind of because even though our our group has a lot of different people and um, races inside of it uh, for friends. We don't really know too much or have too much of an encounter with that particular race of people. And so I haven't really focused too much on that aspect yet. But I thought since we now have uh, a time where we've gotten a large group of gully dwarves here and we have a large section where we actually see the gully dwarves and see what they're doing and how they are as a race, we would go ahead and talk about them and go ahead and discuss what their role is a little bit and how they are portrayed and how this race of people is developed. Because obviously this is not a regular world. 
we don't know what the gully dwarves are, especially if you've never read it before, or, or any other stories that might have some kind of betrayal of gully dwarves, that these are brand new to you, the, these type of creature, uh, since they're not humans. We don't know much about them, and so when you come in, you the author has to then develop what their characteristics are, who they are, and make it believable as a, for a reader to say, hey, I believe that this is a real type of creature, a real being, and they have a, their own society and their own, um, what's the word? Their own culture. There we go. That's what I was trying to think of. So... First of all, we get right away with Flint that he hates these gully doors. And also that kind of right away when we first meet them as well, a little bit from Flint, you get that these different traits that they have and they continue to prosper throughout the whole time that we are meeting these gully doors. And the first one is that they are stupid, which you can kind of tell they are not the smartest uh, dwarves around the block as you continue to talk to them, including the fact that they can't even count right. They know numbers other than one and two, like four and five, but they do not know how to count, literally count that and what it means to have four of something. Um, we know that there are lots of them. They are running around the, uh, the city, under the city of Zax uh, Sarath. They're everywhere. Tons of them, tons of them, tons of them. And they are just running around doing their own thing. And so we know that they are a very prosperous uh, race. We know that they are cowardly because they definitely do not like any kind of confrontation. As we continue to go through the chapters, we continue to see, um, even from like the high bulbs perspective and things like that, that they know that they're cowards. They're cowards. And that's the uh, that's obvious to them is that they do not like conflict, they do not like pain, and they will um, cower and plead and do whatever they have to, other than confront and fight. And then we've got that they're related to the dwarves. Flint mentioned that, um, or it was either Flint or Tannis that mentioned that they are related to the dwarves. They're just the the dwarves don't like them either, so they kind of cast them out of the mountain, supposedly. And they've got a society that is built with clans. They've got the High Bulb, which is the uh, leader of the clan that Boo Poo's from. And we know that there's other leaders to other clans that are, and I believe it mentions that there are three uh, groups of uh, gully dwarves living together underneath Saxarth. So they are, they do have some kind of rulership or organization of a society in that way. We don't really know too much about what the High Bulb does as far as like uh, legislature and rules and laws and things like that. Uh, it's not really clear, at least at this po moment from what we've viewed of them, but we do know that they wanted that secret knock to be able to view the High Bulb and they want to protect the High Bulb because he's the important person. And we know that they have been enslaved by the Draconians. At least this set of clans has been that are living underneath Saxar. So we know that they are not very um, prominent or at least not very, uh, prominent is not the right word, very, uh, along with like their cowardice, they're, they are easily enslaved, they're easily dictated to, though they are kind of running around on their own. As you can see, the Draconians don't really keep too much of a watch on them, but they have enslaved them and that they are not a free society and they have let themselves be enslaved by these um, these draconians. So that's kind of how we see them at this point, kind of their main um, descriptions, their main qualities, their main aspects of them. Sorry, I keep saying, um, I realize that I'm doing that. I'm just kind of not <laughs> with it right now. I'm trying to keep thinking what I'm trying to say. So please bear with me and hopefully I can get my brain going here. All right, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about how this race was developed as well as what the point of their role in the story is. Because obviously they are in here and they're a part of this world, but for them to be such a big portion of 
the story and we've already got four chapters with them prominently in them possibly more once we continue reading that they have a prominent portion or uh, an effect on our main characters and so we see that this race actually has a reason behind them we see that there is a reason for them being in the story especially at this moment what they contribute what their reasonings are and how they are developed to be seen because as a reader's perspective and as a writer perspective it is important to know these different aspects when you have a race in there that's not a human race that was like something that we normally know we have to develop them we have to see hey how are we going to get the reader to know what this this race is and as a reader you want to know what the, the race is so it's important for both aspects to see how it is developed and it is developed enough that we will be able to understand them and make progress and uh, have an understandable story because they are in them in it and then also we're going to talk a little bit about what role they play once they are in there so first let's talk about the development and so we have kind of three different ways that they are developed in this story at this time the first one is flint the first thing that we see for them is once we realize that they are um, there is because flint points out that they're there by their smell which i find is very interesting that they smell that distinct but flint recognizes them by the smell and he tells the, the group about them. He tells them how he hated them, how he was captured by them, though he did not want to admit that. And a little bit about their qualities and how they're the worst and how they're, you know, a part of the dwarves but were cast out, things like that. And so it's, that's where we start to see them come in and we start to see the very beginning layer of the development that we are given because Flint gives us this information. So we start off slow. We start off with just a little bit, a little bit of a prejudice from Flint, but just a little bit of information that we see and we're gonna see, sorry, that's kind of a confusing question. So we see the little layer of things from Flint. And then as we continue to go and read through the story, we're going to see how the impression we got at the beginning is going to continue whether it changes, it stays the same, whether we agree with Flint, disagree, whatever. So first we've got the first little introduction and then they go out into the hall and we actually meet the gully dwarves. And so the next way that they are developed is by the actual physical manifestation of this race. We see the gully dwarves, we uh, have interactions with the gully dwarves, we um, have personalities that stick out. For example, Boo Poo, who she is... Um, in it quite a bit and you actually see her personality and talk to her and see her at her actions and things like that and you see the other gully dwarves actions as like they jump on the chains or as they're running around or as they're cheering as they're fighting in the pot that's all interactions and knowledge that we get based on actually observing and being around and being a part of the gully dwarves and having them interact with our story so that is the next way that they are developed and it is important because that is the most natural way to um, get them kind of in there is that you s actually have the characters firsthand see what they are. We aren't just being described to and it's not just in like the narration. We are finding out these aspects from a little bit of uh, coordination and, and being told about it but also a little bit uh, mostly not just a little bit mostly by how we see these gully dwarfs behaving in reaction to our main characters and how they interact with them and what we see from them on a action basis. And then we see um, a little bit kind of the same kind of concept as we see how they handle their situation. So we see them acting as they normally would no matter what. This is what they're doing. They're cheering for the people um, that are in the pods because this is the most excitement they've had the whole time or whatever. But then we see what happens when uh, there's actual problems and concerns like Boo Poo with, you know, uh, even though she's bespelled, okay, how is she going to handle the situation where they have to, to um, go against all the big bosses? She finds this other passageway and she's very calm and collected. And we see these other um, gully dwarves that then once, at first when they first see the uh, intruders, the heroes, 
they are not very happy. They're very hostile. They're uh, angry. So their situation of them seeing a danger presented that they're not sure about, they get hostile. And though they are cowardly, they are mean <laughs> toward them. And that then they would go if they got... Sorry about that. That was my phone. Let me make sure that's on silent. Um, and then they would go and run away. Or like with the high bulb. We've got that the high bulb was so cowardly that when they heard that there was an army coming, he was hiding under his desk and they had to pry him out. So you see that the cowardly as well as you see the mean portions. And they even mean to each other. When Bopu comes up and um, she knocks on the door and does the knock wrong, they're very hostile to each other. Um, at least in the way they're speaking and the way that when they don't agree, they get pretty, uh, pretty into it pretty quickly. So you see based on the situations that they're in, you see based on them just interacting or just being around in the environment, and you see from Flint's point of view, which Flint con continues to interject his feelings on the matter as they continue to go through the gully doors. Now for the second portion as what do we experience as a reader from uh, these gully doors and how, what role do they play in this story? How do they affect the story, what is their purpose for being in this story at this moment. So we see that they're a little bit of twofold for their purpose. We've got the first purpose, which is to be an obstacle. As we know, that's what we think they're going to be in general when we first meet them, is they are an obstacle that must be overcome. And they are pretty easy to overcome as an obstacle because Raslin puts that magic spell on them and they become friends. At least that portion of the gully doors becomes friends and protects them. But they are, in its essence, at least at the beginning, an obstacle. That they're like, okay, these gully doors are in the way of us getting to where we want to go and we have to find a way to brush them aside, a way to make them so they don't matter, make it so they won't go and cause more problems by uh, getting the draconians involved and things like that. So at first they are the a um, problem and an obstacle that must be resolved. And then the second part is after they overcome this obstacle, at least at the basis that their obstacle, we do have another obstacle with them later, which we'll discuss. But at the very beginning, as they make the friend spell on them, we've got Boo Boo who comes up and she is like the main person. We're not really sure why the friend spell hits her more than everybody else, or maybe it's just because she's smarter. I don't know. We don't really know. Let me know if you have any uh, comments on it or anything that you want to say and feelings about it and about Boo Poo, whether you think you know why she kind of steps up or whatever. But we do know that she steps up and that then she becomes their guide. Out of all the other gully dwarves that like uh, Raslin and admire him or whatever, they do end up helping him out a little bit like those ones that jump on the chain to make the other pot go down so that way the draconians aren't coming up anymore. But a lot of them are simple-minded. They just kind of adore him, wander around with him, want to be with him, close to him. But Boo Boo's the one that's actually pretty smart and she's like, okay, what what can I do to please you? And Razan says, we need to get to the dragon's lair. How are we going to do that? Or how do we get uh, around the big bosses? We don't want any of those. And she's like, okay, I'm going to take you to the high bulk. And she guides them through Zach Sara. She is the guide character, at least at this present moment. She is the whole reason that they can get through it without all this fighting and without the dragon knowing that they are underneath the city so far. Especially when you see the moment when the dragon's talking to the draconium and the draconians all think that they're still on the upper levels running around and nobody seems to know where they're at. That's because Boo Boo was able to take them through the secret path, though gross path that it was, but they were able to go through the secret pass and she was able to guide them then to the high bulb. And the high bulb is also a bit twofold. He is the epitome of what the gully doors are in a way. We've got the gully door, uh, gorf side where there's an obstacle still, and he does become more of an obstacle because he has now alerted the dragon to the presence of 
the heroes and that they are going to be coming to her lair. And so he has now caused problems. He is an obstacle in their way. They were not able to brush him aside because they didn't realize that he was an obstacle, but now he has created more problems and has created something that's going to be even more significant. But he is also their guide because he had that map that Boo Poo then read. So again, Boo Poo is important for the guy position. But the high bulb also has that role where he had the map that without the map, um, they would not have any landmarks to know about anything. Obviously, the map isn't very good. And they even joke about how the high bulb cannot read it anymore, which he can't. But he is helping them guide them to the lair. And Boo Poo is also helping guide them to the lair. So really, they are a very important part for Zach Sarath because without them, they could not make it as far as they did. But with them, they are also having problems with getting around the city and trying not to be known by the dragon, which happened anyway because of the high bulb. So let me know what else you think about the gully dwarves, if anything, any more thoughts or concerns or comments, and uh, let me know. And we're going to then move on to Boo Poo, which I think is a great segue from the gully dwarves because obviously she is a gully dwarf, and we kind of discussed her a little bit in her guide role up previously. So now that we are going on to Boo Poo, we're going to kind of shift focuses from her for her. So we've already got our guide aspect, and now we're going to focus on her as a character. Because we haven't totally had another character that is important enough to be a secondary character. Someone who is in there enough and has a role in the uh, story, but isn't a prominent character. We mostly have our high, uh, our uh, group of tight-knit characters here, our heroes. And then we have some characters here and there that kind of come in and go, but no one that stayed here for this long. Like the Forest Master was only there for a chapter, less than a chapter, if you count them leaving and stuff like that. Or Tika Whalen at the beginning, she wasn't that prominent of a character. She was only in the one little portion and helped them escape, but that was it. Boo Poo has been in here for four chapters so far, and it seems that she will be in more of them. And she has a prominent role of helping these uh, characters to continue forward. So I kind of wanted to discuss a little bit about how we see her development and how it is developed from a, a small character, a small character that comes in in the middle, how we develop them on a quicker basis because since she is coming in later to the game. And she might most likely have only a short time. We don't know for sure. Maybe she will travel with the companions after this. But from all that we know right now is that she's just a secondary character that's helping them in this moment. So because she's only in the small portion of the story, at least as far as we know at this point that she's going to be, that we have to develop her quicker. We have to feel that she is a character that is real and solid and that we know who she is on a much quicker basis. We don't have the three books from beginning to end to develop her as a character. We have this moment and this set of scenes that she's going to be in this only this section amount of time and especially with her coming in late we have to develop her a bit quicker because we only have a quick amount of time to get to her and a quick amount of time where we are going to be having her in the story. So she must be developed in a way that we can believe her and see that she actually is a person that would do the things that she did and will be continuing to go through this story. As, and can, even after it's done, you will remember her and say, hey, yeah, we believe that this person or this creature was there and actually did help and has a real life that would continue on after the characters leave her. So the question is, do we believe that she is developed in a good way in this story? Do we believe that we see her as a realistic character? Do we see these uh, continuations of that you think that yes, this is who she is and can define it? And for me, maybe not for you, let me know if you have a different opinion, but for me, she is developed extremely well. Because we get her as someone under a spell, but she feels like she's her own person. 
she feels like a little bit obviously we know that she's being so friendly because of the spell but in a way it seems like it's genuine from her and we believe at least i believe that she would act the way that she does she continues to have the same problems throughout the uh time that they're with her and the fact that she can't count right and she continues to say the same kind of things and she has these different quirks first with the mouse and then again with the lizard so we've got these similar uh qualities from her again and again and she it makes me feel like she is a real person someone who has uh real thoughts and feelings and uh a personality because of these similar qualities and they come in kind of underneath everything else so we come and we meet her and we eventually it's it's all based on actions again just like we talked about before how they were the, the gully doors were developed based on their actions everything that she does is developed by actions we don't get anything from like narration pretty much we don't really get any thing from flint because flint does not know her particularly so we feel who she is based on the way she acts and the way she acts has a lot of, of continuity to it so for me i feel like they developed her very very well we have a natural progression of knowing who she is in the small amount of time we see her quirks they bring reasonably bring those in and we see her like i said again her counting and we see it, they they naturally bring in her having to count several times with first counting the draconians and then the knocks at the door and we also see that she is a part of this culture because when she does the knocks on the door, the other Dolly Dwarves are all not knowing how to count either. So you see that, yes, she is also a part of this group that she is supposed to be, and it is realistic. So, again, we covered her as a guide character, and we have to quickly learn that she, uh, why she would be the guide, and we do see that she is smarter than the rest. And that she does know more passages and more things than the rest. She does, uh, she has been to the lair. We even find out that she went there to get the emerald that uh, Raslin ends up finding from her. She knows how to get there. And so we see that she is an, a good guide character as well. Because she has already done these different things. So that We already know that she knows all these passageways and that she knows how to get from here and there sneakily. She goes to some places that the other gully dwarves don't know. So they do have that one secret passageway that they were coming up, but for waving the rat in front of the door, it seemed like nobody else really knew about that because when they first passed the door, there's nobody and nothing inside. It's a secret passageway that she has discovered and been able to go around in. So the, uh, the fact that she gets developed quickly and things like that and the fact that she is so well developed also separates her from the rest sorry that was a very bad segue let me go ahead and back up a second and let me uh reintroduce what i'm trying to say so we've developed her and we discussed how we get developed and now i'm uh trying to talk about the reasoning that she is so well developed the reason that she is a character that stands out and why that's necessary we, the point to Boo Poo is yes to be this guy character and we also need that development to distinguish her from the rest. That's what I'm trying to get at. Whew, sorry, again, my brain's not with it today. We have need to distinguish her as this guide character because that is what Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman need her to do, is to guide these characters. So they have to develop her more than they develop any of the other Gully Dorbs or any of the other characters other than a little bit of the high bulb. They do a little bit of the high bulb, but we will get to him in a minute. Right now we're just discussing Boo Poo. Um, so the point of making sure that she is developed and developed well is because she must stand out from the rest. She can't just seem like any other one in the passing crowd. And there can't be too many other Gully Dorbs that are prominently discussed because otherwise it wouldn't set her apart. She is the one that is the guide, and so they have set her up through their development, through their uh, singularity of her. So yes, we do have the other ones, but they are mentioned as an other set of gully dwarves. She is one thing, and the rest is the rest. Um, 
and they have her a lot of times being the only person to go with the group. The rest get left behind once they go through that secret passageway. Um, and they do come back again once they get down to the bottom floor of the, um, where the, the high bolt is. There's more that come around. But she is the one that sticks through it, and that's why she is signified as important. She is an important character that will then continue with us, that she has now become a uh, particular um, higher status in the story because she has been singled out and because she is this guide character. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns on Bupu since my brain did not make it where I could talk to you and uh, transfer my thoughts as easily as I would like to. So let me know and let me know if you have any other comments, questions, or concerns about her. So I know we're talking a lot about the gully dwarves, but I feel like they're a really good way, um, especially since they were so prominent in this section, to really discuss character development and um, the difference between some of the other characters that we've had and these more developed characters that are coming in as secondary characters. And so the next one I want to talk about is the High Bulb because he is also developed more than any of the other, uh, uh, any other Gully Dwarves. So here's how he is different and what makes him the High Bulb and the leader. We've got that he is smarter than the rest. He is cunning and devious and calculating. He is not just another Dolly Dwarf that counts one plus one plus one is two. <laughs> We've got a character who, though was not the smartest, like he did not draw a very good map for him to get back to the dragon's lair, but he is greedy and he is devious and he is smarter than the rest. He actually knows um, street smarts, you would say, instead of being um, classically trained and classically smart in like math and things like that. He is street smart. He is good at conniving and getting what he wants and manipulating people, just as he is manipulating our characters into going and killing the dragon for him. He specifically knew how to play it off that he was going to help them and that he didn't know what their plans were, but he did have a hole that was uh, in the wall so he could listen to people's conversations and already know what was going on before they came and saw him. And then, not only that, he wants to work whatever they're doing to his own, uh, his own plans. He's going to go ahead and tell the dragon, hey, these people are coming for you just so that way they will then be forced to kill the dragon. And then he can go be greedy and get all of the treasure for himself. Though, in a way, you could say he's also not that smart considering the travelers really would give him all the things and they're not really thieves and liars like he suspects them to be. But I kind of have to give that to him in the fact that he doesn't really know much about the other races of Kryn. He's in Zaxarath and he's just part of the other gully dwarves. It's most of the people he has to live with are stupid idiots that if they're lying, yeah, they're thieves. They're going to be stealing stuff there. The... Uh, not the cream of the crop. So for him, it's kind of makes sense that he would make that leap. So he obviously is also a part of being the obstacle like we talked about before. So we also have to develop him in the fact that uh, for him to become a greater obstacle because the other gully dwarves, they weren't much um, talked about or discussed and they were easily overcome. But this one is standing out again above the rest. So we've got that little development before they even meet him. So that way we kind of know a little bit about him and know a little bit how things are going to go. For when the heroes arrive, we already don't trust him because we have that little snippet of, um, from his point of view, of what he wanted. He wanted the dragon to be dead and he wanted to get the treasure and that he couldn't remember his own map anyway. So we see that there's that development to make him stand out against all the other gully doors and to show that he is smarter and that he is different and that is why he becomes this obstacle. Whew. Go ahead and give me just one second. I'm going to get a little bit of a drink of a water here before we continue on. Whew. Okay. So let me just go ahead and check my notes, see if there's anything else I want to discuss on the high bulb. 
Oh uh, yes, yeah. so we also have, because he is this obstacle, I just want to mention that we also have then the tension that kind of runs through um, as a reader's perspective. Because we know that the high bulb is planning this and we know that the high bulb is doing this behind their back, we know that there is this problem that the uh, heroes don't know. They believe that he is just giving them their map and they don't trust him, but they don't see any reason why they would he would betray them. And obviously, that is because he, like we mentioned before, he does not really know them. And so he believes that they are thieves and going to steal the treasure. But because they don't realize that he thinks that, and that he has that expectation of them, that they don't see any reason why he's going to go against them. So we've got this tension of like, oh man, don't trust him, don't trust him, this is what's happening behind your back. And the... Uh, uh, naivete or the ignorance of our heroes that don't know anything that he is plotting. Whew. All right. I know that the high bulb kind of went through a little bit more quickly, but I felt like because he is not as much of a um, main character, he's even less than Bupu, we didn't have to discuss him as much. Uh, and I still feel like we got a pretty good understanding of his purpose and his role in this portion of the story, considering he's in only a chapter and not even from the beginning of it to the end of it. So let's go ahead and move on to the nitty gritty instead. I've got, let's see on my notes here, I've got two main nitty gritty points that I would like to go ahead and discuss in uh, some detail. I've got my trusty dusty book here again for us to look a little bit more closely at these points and I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit of them too. So for me, this first uh, section that we're going to be talking about is the point where um, we first have this interaction with this god and what that's like to have um, compared to this whole rest of the book that, yes, we've kind of heard about the gods, but now we are actually speaking to a god and a god is speaking to Gold Moon and what that is like. And so I, my page is um, 177 for my copy of the book. Uh, so let's go ahead and just read the interaction that Gold Moon has with the uh, goddess Mishakal. Just mostly uh, what the god is saying, not so much uh, anything beforehand, just right when we get to the god speaking. Do not be ashamed of your questioning, beloved disciple. It was your questioning that led us to, that led you to us. And it is your anger that will sustain you through the many trials ahead. You come seeking the truth and you shall receive it. The gods have not turned away from man. It is man who turned away from the true gods. Kryn is about to face its greatest trial. Men will need the truth more than ever. You, my disciple, must return the truth and power of the true gods to man. It is time to restore the balance of the universe. Evil now has tipped its skip tip the scales. For as the gods of good have returned to man, so have the gods of evil, constantly striving for men's souls. The queen of darkness has returned, seeking that which will allow her to walk freely in this land once more. Dragons, once banished to the nether regions, walk the land. Dragons, thought Gold Moon dreamily, she found it difficult to concentrate and grasp the words that flowed her mind, that flooded her mind. It would not be until later that she would fully comprehend the message. Then she would remember the words forever. To gain the power to defeat them, you will need the truth of the gods. This is the greatest gift which you were told. Below this temple in the ruins haunted by the glories of ages past, rest the discs of Mishakal, circular discs made of gleaming platinum. Find the discs and you can call upon my power, for I am Mishakal, goddess of healing. Your way will not be easy. The gods of evil know and fear the great power of the truth. The ancient and powerful black dragon, Kithoth, uh, Kithanith, I think, Kiss, Kisanth, Kisanth, known to the man, uh, known to men as Onyx, guard the discs. Her lair is in the ruined city of Zaxar below us. Danger lies ahead of you if you choose to try and recover the discs. Therefore, I bless this staff. 
present it boldly, never wavering, and you shall prevail. So it's a pretty, pretty interesting monologue. And in this portion, we've got a lot going on because of this little section, this little, not even a full page. Well, maybe if you count the, the turn of the page, maybe a full page, if that, of writing. And we see that it is emphasized because of the italics. So we know that this is the God speaking and the God's words that are coming there. So we do have it, um, high, uh, it sectioned off. There we go. We do have it where it is prominated. We do have the added difference. So that way we don't have it just be on the same level. It's in italics. It's in a special font like kind of thing where we have it displayed that this is a holy uh, being talking. So we have it sectioned off and we have it this prominent thing and we see that it's this God is talking. So what is the point of it? What is the point of finally introducing the gods to this story and in this way? And the first thing first I'd like to say is that there is a moment, this is the moment where it's kind of like feeding the characters and the readers. And I use little quotation marks around feeding because this is where a lot of the questions we've had from the beginning to this point have been answered. We know now what the staff is. We know that there are gods and that something is happening with the gods, the good gods and the bad gods coming down, just like Raslin said with the constellations. We know that there is evil why, why the evil is now coming into this world. We are getting a lot of the questions that we've had from day one, first page of the series, of this uh, book, and they are now finally being answered. What is it, was it again? Almost, you know, almost two thirds into the book. We are finally getting the answers that we were hoping for at the beginning. So, this is even for the characters. The characters are wondering what the heck is going on. Why are we doing all this? Where are we going? What is happening? And so we finally, both as characters and uh, as readers, we finally have a moment of like, our answers are coming. We've got our questions and now we finally got our answers. We were wondering when we were going to get them. But we finally got them. But... The catch is, is to have those questions answered. Now we have new questions that are presented. Now our questions are, well, a little bit. This is one that wasn't answered. But even more so, we're like, well, why are these uh, particular characters and these people chosen to do this? Why do we need the discs in Mishakal versus the staff? What truly is the difference? Why? If the staff is blessed by her, why do we need the discs? And we talk about how they need the truth of the gods to um, be the true, um, sorry again about the, all the ums, I'm my brain is not with it. As we can tell through the rest of this whole video, I'm not with it. Um, but why, how are they going to get this truth? And how is it going to be a weapon against the, the evil? And how does that work? And again, what is it about the discs? So it all kind of revolves around the discs. When, and we got the question of what did they do with this once they got that? Got them. What next? Where are they going to go then? What is the point? And again, so we, we've got that we um, have gone through the book and we finally get these answers and now we're creating new answers. So it's a point of feeding them. Uh, feeding us and feeding the characters because now they know and we know that we will get our questions answered like we were hoping from the beginning um, and that everything that we were promised to know we now know and so we can now take these new questions and we can continue forward with them now we want to know okay we've got to this point and now we're not just irritated because we never get our questions answered now we know that we get our questions answered oh and now we've got some new ones so now we've got to continue going on now we've got to continue it on and we have new renewed faith that we will get the answers to those questions. So it's kind of a way to, for the authors to keep us going and going. And there's not just stuck in the one set of questions and the one um, journey. And 
along with that, because we have answered these questions, now we are changing the parameters of the story. Now we are changing exactly um, what's happening in the story, where it's going. So now instead of them just blindly going along, now we've got a task for them to do and it's specifically assigned to them. We've got gods in the world. Now we've got um, progress that's going to be made because our, our story has now become led by a direction instead of them just blindly like, okay, we gotta run from these people. Okay, we gotta run from these people. Okay, the Forest Master did give them a little bit of a task to get to Zax, uh, Sarth, but now this is an official like assignment. So we see that the parameters and the reasons behind us going forward has changed. Instead of just going because you have to go and you have to get somewhere, we're going because the humankind needs this to survive. This is what is, this is what we have to do in order to get uh, the discs. And those discs are, so we don't know yet, somehow going to help the humankind uh, save itself. So now there is a goal and a reason and a motivation behind where we're going. These characters are not just going around doing what's needed just to survive. We now have a goal to work toward. So we're going to see how that plays out through the rest of this book and to the next two books and to see where we go from there and what kind of parameters, if it will change, if it will continue to be this way, or what's going to happen next in that uh, this uh, plot progression. All right. Now, the next thing that we we're going to discuss, and my last thing that I really wanted to discuss today, is not really a discussion. To me, this is more of a question because I don't even have an answer for it myself. I thought about it, and I was really struck by this paragraph that I, we're going to go ahead and read together. But I wasn't sure what to make of it, or what I felt like the purpose was, or what I felt like really um, mattered about it. So I'd like to go ahead and open it up for everyone to go ahead and comment down below on what you think, on how you felt about it. If you know, if you don't know, whatever, go ahead and just have a discussion with me. I'd love to hear your thoughts and feelings about it. So it's the uh, right before what we just read, uh, Goldmoon has this anger about having to not be with Riverwind and having to once again uh, be called away from him and to go ahead and do the duty that she must do despite wanting to help her loved ones. And she has this little angry moment. So it's going to be on 176 was the page that is on my copy. And again, I know all of us have different copies, right? It's about the uh, third-ish paragraph, um, right after the sentence with all the dots. Uh, I can't see them, dot, 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 riverwind, dot, dot, dot. It's right, the paragraph that starts right after that. It says, but there was no answer. This isn't fair, Goldmoon screamed silently, clutching her fists. We never wanted this. We only wanted to love each other. And now, now we may lose that. We have sacrificed so much and none of it has made any difference. I am 30 years old, mother. 30 and childless. They have taken my youth, they have taken my people, and I have nothing to show in return. Nothing except this. She shook the staff, and now I am being asked once again to give still more. I find it very interesting that she has this moment of rage and this moment of all the anguish in her life, all the terrible things that she has had to go through to get to where she's at, and still she's asked for more and she can almost not take it. And I just find it a really powerful moment. It's really a powerful expression of how we feel. We, we see Gold Moon and she has her moments and things like that that we see from her perspective, but we've never seen this. We've never seen her truly be angry about something. We've never truly seen her have these high emotions. We've seen her, yes, with, um, being trusting and being the calm and being the opposite of Riverwind with him not trusting them, the group, and not wanting to go and not wanting to stay with them or whatever else. And we see her one-sided nature of 
calm and collected and she's going to do what she's going to do and yes she's going to follow these people even though they might not be trustworthy but here we actually see her being angry and see her feelings for Riverend and how this is affecting what she feels like she mustn't do and she still does it anyway and I know it in one of the uh, paragraphs either around it or whatever she had mentioned that she was not as strong as Riverwind but I feel like she is very strong in this moment that she would hold back the urge when everything goes black and she can't see her friends and she knows something bad is happening that she has the nerve and the um, patience and the trust to go ahead and push that aside after her moment of rage to turn around and to walk away from them. I find that very interesting. So it just really struck me and I really wanted to know what your thoughts on were because I wasn't really sure how to classify it, what I was going to talk about for it, what I really felt about it even, to know what the point of me bringing it up would be. Other than that I decided I wanted to ask you what you thought about it and how you feel um, with Gold Moon and everything like that. So go ahead and leave in the comments below anything that you have on that paragraph and if it struck you or anything else. Um, yeah, so that was the main amount of topics I wanted to cover today, the main thing, since I know I've covered a lot of Gully Dwarf talk, but they were a big portion of this chapter that were new and came into this story, so I thought that it would be a good time to discuss them in general, and that they were a main portion to be discussing, and very important to discuss. So, uh, yeah, let me know any comments, questions, or concerns for the, um, anything that was discussed this week or in previous weeks, if you decide to, you can see correlations or anything else, go ahead and let me know in the comments below. I'm always happy to hear your thoughts, and I really would like to have a conversation with you about it. Uh, next week, we're going to be reading chapters 21 through chapter 3, which for my book is page 239 to 296. And I'm kind of excited for next week because I already know that we're going to be discussing a little bit about the um, book uh, sections because as I will show you in a second the reason we're going back to chapter three you probably if you haven't looked ahead or didn't notice it when we first started the book is sectioned into books so we've got the one book that's sectioned into multiple books inside of itself and if we go ahead and start right after the poem if I can turn these pages Oh, and after the prologue, sorry. Okay, we've got book one, which we see is a picture of the dragon. Which, if we see, go back to our chapter that we're on, starting to read, it's the same picture as this dragon. So, we're going to discuss the, uh, the decision to chunk it up and what we think that these chunks are supposed to be doing and separating and framing and how that's going to happen and things like that. So we've got for our section two, we've got this draconian looking thing with a helmet or something. Maybe it's a person, we don't know yet, but they have the staff, uh, another kind of staff and something. So book two, and then it goes back to chapter one. So we've kind of got this little subtitle, sub sections going on here, and I'm excited to see and have a discussion about what that means and where the story is going to go from here. So I guess I will be seeing you then. I'm going to try and get another character analysis up this week if at all possible. Hopefully maybe we'll just flop Wednesdays and Sundays on Wednesdays now being the uh, book discussion and Sundays will be the other one. I'm really hoping that I can get it up on time. Please have faith in me. <laughs> I will try to get that up as soon as possible. I think, let me, I didn't write it down yet. I think I decided that we're going to be discussing Aragon um, from Lord of the Rings as our next character analysis. So I just have to go ahead and write up my plans for that and I will try and film and get it out as close to Sunday as possible. Hope you enjoy the next section of reading and I will see you next week for that. All right, have a wonderful day. Bye.